Chapter Nineteen of The Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsty. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stendhal, translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Nineteen. Thinking produces suffering. The grotesqueness of everyday events conceals the real unhappiness of the passions. By Nave. As he was replacing the usual furniture in the room which Monsieur de la Mole had occupied, Julien found a piece of very strong paper folded in four. He read at the bottom of the first page, To His Excellency Monsieur le Marquis de la Mole, Peer of France, Chevalier of the Orders of the King, etc., etc., it was a petition in the rough handwriting of a cook. Monsieur le Marquis, I have had religious principles all my life. I was in Lyon, exposed to the bombs at the time of the siege, in ninety-three of execrable memory. I communicate. I go to Mass every Sunday in the parochial church. I have never missed the paschal duty, even in ninety-three of execrable memory. My cook used to keep servants before the revolution. My cook fasts on Fridays. I am universally respected in Verrier, and I venture to say I deserve to be so. I walk under the canopy in the processions at the side of the curé and of the mayor. On great occasions I carry a big candle, bought at my own expense. Ask Monsieur the Marquis for the lottery appointment of Verrier, which, in one way or another, is bound to be vacant shortly as the beneficiary is very ill, and moreover votes on the wrong side at elections etc. De Chalon. In the margin of this petition was a recommendation signed de Moirod, which began with this line, I have had the honour, the worthy person who makes this request. So, even that imbecile de Chalon shows me the way to go about things, said Julien to himself. Eight days after the passage of the King of Blank through Ferrier, the one question which predominated over the innumerable falsehoods, foolish conjectures, and ridiculous discussions, etc., etc., which had had successively for their object the King, the Marquis de la Mole, the ten thousand bottles of wine, the fall of Paul de Moirod, who, hoping to win a cross, only left his room a week after his fall, was the absolute indecency of having foisted Julien Sorel, a carpenter's son, into the guard of honour. You should have heard on this point the rich manufacturers of printed calico, the very persons who used to bawl themselves hoarse in preaching equality, morning and evening, in the café. That haughty woman, Madame de Renal, was of course responsible for this abomination. The reason? The fine eyes and fresh complexion of the little Abbé Sorel explained everything else. A short time after their return to Vergy, Stanislas, the youngest of the children, caught the fever. Madame de Renal was suddenly attacked by an awful remorse. For the first time she reproached herself for her love with some logic. She seemed to understand, as though by a miracle, the enormity of the sin into which she had let herself be swept. Up to that moment, although deeply religious, she had never thought of the greatness of her crime in the eyes of God. In former times she had loved God passionately in the convent of the Sacred Heart. In the present circumstances she feared him with equal intensity. The struggles which lacerated her soul were all the more awful and that her fear was quite irrational. Julien found that the least argument irritated instead of soothing her. She saw in the illness the language of hell. Moreover, Julien himself was very fond of the little Stanislas. It soon assumed a serious character. Then incessant remorse deprived Madame de Renal of even her power of sleep. She ensconced herself in a gloomy silence. If she had opened her mouth, it would only have been to confess her crime to God and mankind. I urge you, said Julien to her, as soon as they got alone, not to speak to anyone. Let me be the sole confidant of your sufferings. If you still love me, do not speak. Your words will not be able to take away our Stanislas's fever. But his consolations produced no effect. 
he did not know that Madame de Renal had got it into her head that, in order to appease the wrath of a jealous god, it was necessary either to hate Julien or let her son die. It was because she felt she could not hate her lover that she was so unhappy. "'Fly from me,' she said one day to Julien. "'In the name of God, leave this house. It is your presence here which kills my son. God punishes me,' she added in a low voice. "'He is just. I admire his fairness. My crime is awful, and I was living without remorse,' she exclaimed." That was the first sign of my desertion of God. I ought to be doubly punished. Julien was profoundly touched. He could see in this neither hypocrisy nor exaggeration. She thinks that she is killing her son by loving me, and all the same the unhappy woman loves me more than her son. I cannot doubt it. It is remorse for that which is killing her. Those sentiments of hers have real greatness. But how could I have inspired such a love, I, who am so poor, so badly educated, so ignorant, and sometimes so coarse in my manners? One night the child was extremely ill. At about two o'clock in the morning, Monsieur de Renal came to see it. The child, consumed by fever and extremely flushed, could not recognise its father. Suddenly Madame de Renal threw herself at her husband's feet. Julien saw that she was going to confess everything and ruin herself for ever. Fortunately, this extraordinary proceeding annoyed Monsieur de Renal. Adieu, adieu, he said, going away. No, listen to me, cried his wife on her knees before him, trying to hold him back. Hear the whole truth. It is I who am killing my son. I gave him life, and I am taking it back. Heaven is punishing me. In the eyes of God, I am guilty of murder. It is necessary that I should ruin and humiliate myself. Perhaps that sacrifice will appease the Lord. If Monsieur de Renal had been a man of any imagination, he would then have realised everything. Romantic nonsense, he cried, moving his wife away as she tried to embrace his knees. All that is romantic nonsense. Julien, go and fetch the doctor at daybreak. And he went back to bed. Madame de Renal fell on her knees, half fainting, repelling Julien's help with a hysterical gesture. Julien was astonished. So this is what adultery is, he said to himself. Is it possible that those scoundrels of priests should be right, that they who commit so many sins themselves should have the privilege of knowing the true theory of sin? How droll! For twenty minutes after Monsieur de Renal had gone back to bed, Julien saw the woman he loved with her head resting on her son's little bed, motionless and almost unconscious. There, he said to himself, is a woman of superior temperament brought to the depths of unhappiness simply because she has known me. Time moves quickly. What can I do for her? I must make up my mind. I have not got simply myself to consider now. What do I care for men and their buffooneries? What can I do for her? Leave her? But I should be leaving her alone and a prey to the most awful grief. That automaton of a husband is more harm to her than good. He is so coarse that he is bound to speak harshly to her. She may go mad and throw herself out of the window. If I leave her, if I cease to watch over her, she will confess everything, and who knows? In spite of the legacy which she is bound to bring him, he will create a scandal. She may confess everything, great God, to that scoundrel of an abbe who makes the illness of a child of six an excuse for not budging from this house, and not without a purpose either. In her grief and her fear of God, she forgets all she knows of the man. She only sees the priest. Go away, said Madame de Renal suddenly to him, opening her eyes. I would give my life a thousand times to know what could be of most use to you, answered Julien. I have never loved you so much, my dear angel, or rather it is only from this last moment that I begin to adore you as you deserve to be adored. What would become of me far from you, and with the consciousness that you are unhappy owing to what I have done? But don't let my suffering come into the matter. I will go, yes, my love, but if I leave you, dear, if I cease to watch over you, 
to be incessantly between you and your husband you will tell him everything you will ruin yourself remember that he will hound you out of his house in disgrace besancon will talk of the scandal you will be said to be absolutely in the wrong you will never lift up your head again after that shame that's what i ask she cried standing up i shall suffer so much the better but you will also make him unhappy through that awful scandal but i shall be humiliating myself throwing myself into the mire and by those means perhaps i shall save my son such a humiliation in the eyes of all is perhaps to be regarded as a public penitence so far as my weak judgment goes is it not the greatest sacrifice that i can make to god perhaps he will deign to accept my humiliation and to leave me my son show me another sacrifice which is more painful and i will rush to it let me punish myself i too am guilty do you wish me to retire to the trappist monastery the austerity of that life may appease your god oh heaven why cannot i take stanislas's illness upon myself ah oh, you do love him then said madame de renal getting up and throwing herself in his arms at the same time she repelled him with horror i believe you i believe you oh my one friend she cried falling on her knees again why are you not the father of stanislas in that case it would not be a terrible sin to love you more than your son won't you allow me to stay and love you henceforth like a brother it is the only rational atonement it may appease the wrath of the most high am i she cried getting up and taking julien's head between her two hands and holding it some distance from her am i to love you as if you were a brother is it in my power to love you like that julien melted into tears i will obey you he said falling at her feet i will obey you in whatever you order me that is all there is left for me to do my mind is struck with blindness i do not see any course to take if i leave you you will tell your husband everything you will ruin yourself and him as well he will never be nominated deputy after incurring such ridicule if i stay you will think i am the cause of your son's death and you will die of grief do you wish to try the effect of my departure if you wish i will punish myself for our sin by leaving you for eight days i will pass them in any retreat you like in the abbey of bray le haute for instance but swear that you will say nothing to your husband during my absence. Remember that if you speak, I shall never be able to come back. She promised, and he left, but was called back at the end of two days. It is impossible for me to keep my oath without you. I shall speak to my husband if you are not constantly there to enjoin me to silence by your looks. Every hour of this abominable life seems to last a day. Finally, heaven had pity on this unfortunate mother little by little stanislas got out of danger but the ice was broken her reason had realized the extent of her sin she could not recover her equilibrium again her pangs of remorse remained and were what they ought to have been in so sincere a heart her life was heaven and hell hell when she did not see julien heaven when she was at his feet I do not deceive myself any more, she would say to him, even during the moments when she dared to surrender herself to his full love. I am damned, irrevocably damned. You are young, heaven may forgive you, but I, I am damned. I know it by a certain sign. I am afraid. Who would not be afraid at the sight of hell? But at the bottom of my heart I do not repent at all. I would commit my sin over again if I had the opportunity. If heaven will only forbear to punish me in this world and through my children, I shall have more than I deserve. But you, at any rate, my Julienne, she would cry at other moments, are you happy? Do you think I love you enough? The suspiciousness and morbid pride of Julienne, who needed, above all, a self-sacrificing love, altogether vanished when he saw at every hour of the day so great and indisputable a sacrifice he adored madame de renal 
it makes no difference her being noble and my being a labourer's son she loves me she does not regard me as a valet charged with the functions of a lover that fear once dismissed julien fell into all the madness of love into all its deadly uncertainties at any rate she would cry seeing his doubts of her love let me feel quite happy during the three days we still have together let us make haste perhaps tomorrow will be too late if heaven strikes me through my children it will be in vain that i shall try only to live to love you and to be blind to the fact that it is my crime which has killed them i could not survive that blow even if i wished i could not i should go mad ah if only i could take your sin on myself as you so generally offered to take stanislas's burning fever this great moral crisis changed the character of the sentiment which united julien and his mistress his love was no longer simply admiration for her beauty and the pride of possessing her henceforth their happiness was of a quite superior character the flame which consumed them was more intense they had transports filled with madness judged by the worldly standard their happiness would have appeared intensified but they no longer found that delicious serenity that cloudless happiness that facile joy of the first period of their love when madame de renal's only fear was that julien did not love her enough their happiness had at times the complexion of crime in the happiest and apparently their most tranquil moments madame de renal would suddenly cry out oh great god i see hell as she pressed julien's hand with convulsive grasp what horrible tortures i have well deserved them she grasped him and hung on to him like ivy onto a wall julien would try in vain to calm that agitated soul she would take his hand cover it with kisses then relapsing into a gloomy reverie she would say hell itself would be a blessing for me i should still have some days to pass with him on this earth but hell on earth the death of my children still perhaps my crime will be forgiven me at that price oh great god do not grant me my pardon at so great a price these poor children have in no way transgressed against you i i am the only culprit i love a man who is not my husband julien subsequently saw madame de renal attain what were apparently moments of tranquillity she was endeavouring to control herself she did not wish to poison the life of the man she loved they found the days pass with the rapidity of lightning amid these alternating moods of love remorse and voluptuousness julien lost the habit of reflecting mademoiselle elisa went to attend to a little lawsuit which she had at Ferrier she found valenod very piqued against julien she hated the tutor and would often speak about him you will ruin me monsieur if i tell the truth she said one day to valenod all masters have an understanding amongst themselves with regard to matters of importance there are certain disclosures which poor servants are never forgiven after these stereotyped phrases which his curiosity managed to cut short Monsieur Valenod received some information extremely mortifying to his self-conceit. This woman, who was the most distinguished in the district, the woman on whom he had lavished so much attention in the last six years, and made no secret of it, more was the pity, this woman who was so proud, whose disdain had put him to the blush times without number, had just taken for her lover a little workman masquerading as a tutor, and to fill the cup of his jealousy madame de renal adored that lover and added the housemaid with a sigh julien did not put himself at all to make his conquest his manner was as cold as ever even with madame elisa had only become certain in the country but she believed that this intrigue dated from much farther back that is no doubt the reason she added spitefully why he refused to marry me and to think what a fool i was when i went to consult madame de renal and begged her to speak to the tutor the very same evening monsieur de renal received from the town together with his paper 
a long anonymous letter which apprised him in the greatest detail of what was taking place in his house. Julien saw him pale as he read this letter, written on blue paper, and looked at him with a malicious expression. During all that evening the mayor failed to throw off his trouble. It was in vain that Julien paid him court by asking for explanations about the genealogy of the best families in Burgundy. End of chapter 19 Thinking Produces Suffering <laughs>